So I want to review four, count them, four ideas related to gender in America, really in general, but especially in the 18th century, late 18th century, enlightenment 18th century, when Royal Tyler wrote the contrast. The first idea you can see on the screen is patriarchy. And patriarchy was the prevailing model for gender relationships, basically, until the Enlightenment. There were some variations on it, but the core set of beliefs were that men were in charge, that women were weaker, um, frivolous, um, and most of all, irrational. Uh, and that men were the fountains of reason and order. And patriarchy was often linked to monarchical ideas and through monarchy to uh, divine ideas and God. So parallels were often made between God and the monarch and God and the head of the household who was a man. So there's a whole dominant paradigm that has centuries of cultural power behind it that begins to crumble in the Enlightenment era and under the pressure of the American Revolution. And so newer ideas about gender begin to emerge in the 18th century. And they, they were appearing in various forms earlier on an individual level, but they emerge as social patterns in the 18th century in what is now the United States. And one of the key ideas is this, this culture of sentiment and sensibility. And you hear these words bandied about in the contrast. In particular, they're applied to and spoken by Maria and Manley, who really embrace this idea of the importance of virtue to the human experience and the importance of virtue to really the Republican experience, the national experience and identity. And so you have a lot of conversation or commentary from Manley and Maria in particular about moral improvement and language about promoting virtue and language about uh, helping others to be happy. And that comes from this culture of sentiment or sensibility model that Charlotte originally makes fun of, uh, and then we'll see sort of what happens to her with that over the course of the play. So from this emerging culture of sentiment and sensibility, which is very much a product of uh, 18th century American Enlightenment experience and thought, the idea of companionate marriage, which I mentioned in one of my earlier lectures, starts to take hold. Now, I'm not saying this becomes the dominant form of marriage immediately, but more and more as Americans move through the 18th into the 19th century, the idea that marriages should be organized around love and freely made choice by the partners and uh, the, the idea that affection uh, should be at the heart of things, it really starts to emerge. And you can see that the debate over companionate marriage and its opposition to patriarchy is really central to the play, right? As we'll see, or we've already seen, Maria desires a companionate model of marriage. She's disgusted by Dimple, but feels constrained by her father's power over her, his patriarchal power over her in the culture, and submits to his will. Then we're going to see how that unravels or plays out in uh, Act 4 and 5, which you're going to read after watching this presentation. So I want you to look look for where is that idea promoted, where is it tested, where is it rejected, where is it embraced. And then finally, the last stop on our journey here of key terminology related to gender in the 18th century follows really from the previous three. And it's this idea of Republican motherhood. And this is going to become a very important idea for about 20 or 30 years before it gets sort of replaced by an even more idealized notion of womanhood, which will later be called the cult of femininity or the cult of true womanhood. But this earlier version of an American ideal of femininity Femininity is called Republican motherhood. And the idea here is that women are primarily recognized for their domestic authority. And because of their 
emer- because of an emergent sense of their moral purity and the superiority of their character, something that emerges from actually the culture of sentiment and sensibility, this idea that women are more virtuous than men gives them a special role to play in raising young men and young women, children, who will further the moral development of the country. The the Republican mothers are generating, developing the next generation of Republican Americans. And they have a special role to play in the domestic sphere to achieve that. Now, when you start thinking about, okay, well, what do these Republican mothers need to do? Well, clearly it emerges that they become players in issues of literacy, issues of morality, issues of religion that, of course, are going to bleed out beyond the domestic space into larger public discourses. So even while Republican motherhood tries to put women in the box of the house, gives them a a greater sense of equality than patriarchy does, but still places them in the house, even though it is repressive and suppressive and oppressive in those ways, it still opens the door to forms of female empowerment empowerment in political and public spheres that will be cultivated in the 19th and culminate in the 20th century. So I want you to keep an eye out for these four patterns. The play is very interested in patriarchy and how Uh, parents and children should relate to each other and the authority relationship to them is very interested in the culture of sentiment and sensibility as manifested in particular by manly and maria the obvious opposite character of this is dimple with his lord chesterfield kind of amoral philosophy of personal advancement And, and and we want to keep an eye out for the idea of companionate marriage which is something that the characters are all striving for, all the younger characters are striving for, to various degrees within various frames of respect for the existing dominant patriarchal culture. And then finally, this idea of Republican motherhood. And I, I want to argue that Maria is being presented as a paradigm of Republican mar- motherhood. And Charlotte is being presented as a warning of the problems of women who are not ideals of Republican motherhood and her obsession with materiality and flirtation and superficial, frivolous, romantic ideas is the exact opposite of Maria's earnestness. uh, earnestness. And Maria's Republican motherhood is uh, a challenge to the vision Charlotte has of femininity. And you'll have to read the end of the play to see which vision prevails. Although I think you can probably guess, given uh, the overall uh, historical context of the play. All right, hope this helps you think about the play, gives you some tools. I'm going to ask you in the discussion that follows, after you've read Act 4 and Act 5, I'm going to ask you to find a passage that somehow connects to one or more of these four ideas and explain how it connects. Does the passage support one of these ideas? Does it undercut or challenge these ideas? Does it complicate them? What's the relationship between the passage you choose from the play and one or more of these four ideas in this uh, video lecture? See you in Canvas. Thanks for all your work.